of today's scripture is taken from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31, and it can be found on page 980 in your uh, pew Bible. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. Thank you, David. That was wonderful, wonderful music today. And I'm so glad to see so many out this this morning. I was getting worried a little earlier. It seemed very slim in here, but you filled in nicely. And so I'm so glad for it and so glad for folks at home watching us today to be together. You know I only have a few more Sundays left. Uh, don't mention it. The, the countdown has, has begun. Um, and I want to say this. Um, I have two opportunities to preach, I believe, before the end of the month. I, I understand the 24th is a day of celebration. I've been told I, I'm not to do much that day. But I have prepared uh, a two-part farewell sermon uh, tandem uh, for the 17th and the 31st. You, you, I, I hope you'll be here to hear those two sermons. I hope you'll come back. Those of you who can, those of you online, join us, please. Uh, share the word. Uh, I, would love, I would love to see folks here for those last two words. I've worked hard on putting together something I hope will be meaningful for all of us. Um, from, from the bottom of my heart, so please do that. P- plenty of Kleenexes in the pews, yes. One of Mark's favorite designations for Jesus is rabbi, meaning teacher. Now think back over your own life. Who are those people who have been your best teachers? I almost asked you to think about your most beloved teachers. But I expect many of you would agree with me that when I say that sometimes your most beloved teachers are not your best teachers, teachers who taught you the most about the subject. Looking back, it is the tough teachers that were our best teachers. They, they had a way of, of getting our attention. Some could be very creative about it. One of you told me the story about a school teacher who had injured his back and had to wear a plastic cast, plaster cast around him, uh, the upper part of his body while he was recuperating. The good thing is it fit under his shirt and was not noticeable at all. 
On the first day of school, he finds out that he is going to be in charge of some of the toughest kids in school. Walking confidently into the rowdy classroom, he opened the window as wide as possible and then busied himself with work at his desk while the class was in some chaos. When a strong breeze made his tie flap in the wind, he took the desk stapler and stapled his tie to his chest. <laughs> Needless to say, he had no trouble with discipline the rest of the year. <laughs> Toughness comes in other ways too. When students say that a teacher is tough, hard to please, they don't always mean that as criticism. Sometimes that means that the teacher has extremely high expectations for the students. At other times, a teacher may be difficult to comprehend, impossible to win a good grade from, not because the teacher is not good at explaining the subject matter, but rather because the subject matter itself is very difficult. I, I can't imagine a professor whose subject is nuclear physics ever being known as an easy grader. The subject matter is so demanding and difficult that to be fair to the subject matter, the teacher must be demanding and difficult as well. In my own life, when I think back and remember some of my teachers who were demanding and difficult, I have to say that they were some of the best teachers I had, though perhaps they weren't my most beloved teachers. And one thing that unites all of my toughest teachers is that they all had extremely high expectations of me. I, I would enter a class saying to a teacher, I'm just not good at math. I've never been able to do well in mathematics courses. Then the teacher would say to me, well, you have never studied math with me. I'm going to show you that you may be wrong in your self-assessment. Just follow my directions, and I think you may be surprised by yourself. <laughs> and I indeed was surprised. That teacher found a way to convince me that my skills were better than I thought. Good teacher. I've got teaching on my mind because this Sunday's gospel depicts a man, a, a very successful, a rich man, who comes to Jesus... And he begins by saying, good teacher, good teacher. And then he asks him a theological question. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? You, you kind of expect Jesus to launch immediately into some sort of theological lecture, perhaps defining the phrase eternal life, distinguishing his teaching from that of other rabbis. No, Jesus says that the man already knows the answer to his own question. <laughs> and that is, obey God's commandments. Perhaps to Jesus' surprise, the man claims that he has indeed obeyed all of the commandments. Can you believe that? He has been good at being very good. Then Jesus says to him that he lacks one more act of obedience, one more act, just one. He must go, sell everything he has, and give to the poor, and that the man will then be able to follow me. We preachers have speculated down through the ages on why Jesus commanded the man to divest of all his earthly possessions. Did Jesus think that this particular man was guilty of greediness? Was Jesus attempting to set up this spiritual high achiever for failure, knowing that the man would probably refuse to let go of all of his stuff and follow Jesus? The fact is, we just don't know. What we do know is that the man slumped down, became depressed, and walked away. And Jesus grieves about the difficulty of saving the rich. I expect, if you've been a Christian for a very long time and have heard very many sermons, 
Uh, and if you've heard sermons from preachers who have had the guts to preach on this particular text, then you have heard many different preacherly attempts to explain this story in a way, in a way that does not threaten people like us who have, when compared to the rest of the world, so much stuff. I've been unloading my office for six weeks now. Stuff. Miss Debbie will tell you. Tons of stuff. It's been an emotional roller coaster unloading stuff that has accumulated over time. I know all of you can identify with that. It's painful, hard. Is Jesus asking us to divest from our material goods? Knowing that we are comparatively rich speaking, rich speaking of, of, of the comparison with the rest of the world, does it mean that we too are, are beyond saving? Could that be possible? Well, I want to resist the temptation to explain away this episode so many people do. To diffuse of its power or to help us, me included, weasel out of listening to Jesus' words. So often that's what we do. When he says something tough and hard, we want somebody to explain it away so we don't have to deal with it, so we can deny it, so we don't have to do something about it. But I resist that temptation to let Jesus' words go unnoticed. Perhaps Jesus believed in this rich man more than he believed in himself. Could that be possible? Mark says that Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. Did you hear that? Loved him. Maybe like my math teacher of so long ago, Jesus believed that this rich man was capable of discipleship could actually relinquish his possessions and would be better for it. Rather than accumulating a bunch of stuff for this life, he might find that he could embrace eternal life in Jesus' name. I don't know. All that we do know is that the conversation with the rich man ends with him walking away. You surely notice that in the text. As far as I can tell, this is the only place in any of the Gospels where someone is invited to be a disciple to come follow me and refuses. The rich man, for whatever reason, simply could not imagine his life without all of his stuff. He could not imagine that this good teacher knew what he was teaching. He could not imagine that Jesus was actually addressing him, telling him the truth about himself and the way to eternal life. Jesus must have sighed as he spoke of the virtual impossibility of saving those who are rich, those who attempt to secure our lives by the accumulation of our possessions. And yet... Though this is the end of the good teacher's instruction of this rich man, it is not the end of Jesus' teaching of the disciples. The lecture continues on. We get the impression that the episode with the rich man and the subsequent conversation about who can be saved and who can't be was likely all for the benefit of his disciples. Like any good teacher... Jesus knows the educational advantage of surprising and shocking his students. He tells his disciples that the salvation of the rich is a tough task. He resorts to hyperbole, you know, exaggeration, in saying that it is as tough as attempting to shove a fully loaded camel through the eye of a needle. Mark says, the disciples... Hearing that, we're shocked even more. And they begin to, began to say to each other, well then, who on earth can be saved? And the teacher replies, well, it's impossible with human beings. 
but not with God. All things are possible with God. And then it is as if one of his disciples, Peter, gets the point of the lecture and he speaks out, look, we, your disciples, have left everything and followed you. The disciples have watched a resourceful, rich, well-fixed person be invited to become one of them. But he walks away. But Peter and his fellow disciples have not. There they stand. They have stayed throughout the course of the semester. They have listened to Jesus. Certainly they have not understood everything that the teacher has taught. There have been many moments when they were confused, shocked, or uncertain of his meaning. And yet, notice, they have paid a high tuition. They have left everything and they have followed Jesus. And so have you. Not to be overly dramatic, but I bet there are people here who, though you may, be, may have not left everything in your life, you have had to leave some precious things only following Jesus. Maybe you were forced to lay aside your doubts and follow anyway. Maybe you had to lay aside your anger at the way you were treated in the, in the, by the church and the congregation that you grew up in. Perhaps you had to divest of your, uh, yourself of your justifiable, justifiable resentment that a parent who preached the Christian faith to you did a lousy job of living a Christian life right before you. Maybe you had to take a job that did not pay as much because you did not believe it was suitable Christian employment. Perhaps you had to let go of many, many bad things ideas and feelings that were put into you in the way you were raised in this society just to follow Jesus. I think the contemporary American church often, often makes the mistake in extolling all of the benefits of following Jesus without the cost of following Jesus. The cost. We stress all those aspects in your life that can be fixed by Jesus without admitting to ourselves the many problems that can come to your life simply because you are with Jesus. At least, at least, this rich man considered the high cost of following Jesus and decided up front that he did not want to pay the price. He walked away sorrowful. And yet, the good teacher will not allow us to walk away from this lecture sorrowfully. Jesus ends by commending his disciples. There in the text, look it up. He says, I assure you that anyone who has left house, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, because of me and because of the good news will receive a hundred times as much in, now in this life and in the age to come eternal life. <laughs> Admittedly, there is often a high cost to following Jesus. I, I think I've stated that through 34 years. I've tried not to paint a simple picture of our life. People want easy answers. Folks don't want to struggle with truth. Jesus had a way of getting people's attention and getting them to discovery about themselves and their faith. There are benefits. Perhaps not benefits in this present moment, but in the age that's coming, eternal life, Jesus says. Wow. The good teacher ends this rather demanding lecture by handing out the grades, beaming with joy at the success of his disciples. As we've talked about before, the disciples are not often successful in the Gospel of Mark. They continually misunderstand, misinterpret, and they just don't get it. But this Sunday, this Sunday is different. Jesus commends them. And I think he also commends all of us. We may not be the brightest candles in the box, but at least we are here. 
We are attempting to be faithful and to follow Jesus even though, though we don't completely understand and even though at times we wind up disappointing him and ourselves, we are still following. Well done, says the good teacher, beaming with pride over his students' work. One of my hopes is that I have been a good teacher for you. Not just in the manner in which I taught, but in placing before you the very real challenges of the Christian life in an honest and forthright way. Though sometimes I may have seemed to be really tough on you, my prayer is that you have grown in your faith and understanding of God that you have learned a thing or two about God and, and yourself. My, my goal has never been for you to agree with me, but rather for you to think about your faith and life in this world. If I can send you out those doors thinking about something, even if you're angry with what I said, then I have done my job. And I have been privileged to watch you grow over 34 years. Praise God, none of us is what we were thanks to the ongoing work of grace in our lives. The ongoing work of grace in our lives. So I look out at you today, all of you here, those of you at home, Every one of you who had a, has had a unique story as part of Bethany Christian Church. And I say to you from the bottom of my heart, well done. Amen. Well done, my friends. You've hung in there. You've listened. And you have grown. What more could a pastor ask? What more? What more? What more could Jesus have asked of his disciples? Look where they were, and then look how they wound it up later. <laughs> look at you guys. I've seen you, some of you from infancy. Now you're young people, active in church and doing so many things in the community. It's just an amazing story. It's God's story, the story of love in Christ. I hope, I hope that you appreciate that. I hope that you've gotten a lot out of that. It is who we are. Jesus challenges every single one of us every single day. There's something new coming that we must face together as faithful people. Is your faith where it needs to be? Is it strong enough? Invite Christ into your heart and life if you've never done so. Begin there. Begin that journey with him. If, if you have... Re-up. Say, I, I need to rededicate my life to Jesus. Commit myself to Bible reading and prayer. Getting in small groups in the life of the congregation. Connecting with other Christians. Strengthening ourselves as we face a tough world. You know, the world's never been easy. We always look back at the past and say, oh, it was so much better in the past. Do you think our parents would have said that? I know my mom and dad didn't think that. They went through the Great Depression. It's always been tough. Always, Jesus challenges us to grow. Make a decision for Christ today in whatever way. You can do it quietly, pub privately where you sit, or you can come forward and make some declaration before the congregation. Whatever decision you make, make it today as we sing our closing hymn of invitation. It's, it's an old, old favorite. Are ye able, said the master. Let's sing the first, second, and last. First, second, and last verses. Shall we stand together and sing?